What's going on everybody? We are in week three of the new year. Can you believe it? God has been so good. You know, in the new year, people make resolutions. And one of the top resolutions that people make is to enter into a relationship with a gym, a gymnasium, I mean. In other words, people are trying to better their health. They're trying to improve their stamina. They're trying to become better because we recognize that our bodies are a temple of God and God can't do anything in our lives without our natural bodies. But I also realize that God uses gems to develop us. We call them spiritual gems. Some of you know them as the wilderness, right? The Bible says in Matthew chapter four, verse one, that Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the enemy. You know, the wilderness causes us to realize that we're totally dependent upon God. It also introduces us to ourselves because it shows us whether we're genuine or if there's some areas in our life that really need improvement. And so in this message that we shared today, we talked from the subject title, God's Gym. Somebody's in a dry place, perhaps you, and they need to know that they're not in the wilderness all by themselves. If that is you or somebody you know, then this message is for you. Listen, we are trying our very best to get the word out to you as quick and as prompt as possible because we realize um, that God has called us to reach people even beyond the four walls of this church. And one of the ways you can connect with us is by joining Evangel Nation. That's for in-person members, it's for online members, it's also for those partners who want updates, who want connection, who desire community. The reason God founded the church is because he didn't want man to be alone. And I believe we're better together. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron. And so check out the QR code and you'll get all the information you need. Listen, it's 2024 and we are praying without ceasing. We're keeping you in our hearts. We're keeping your petitions even before the Lord as you submit them. And I wanna encourage you to continue to pray for us. We got some great days ahead and we're literally trying to take the gospel of Jesus Christ all across the world and with your support, that can be possible. So God bless you. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, and again, Happy New Year. Y'all ready for the word? Yeah, yeah. So let's go there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And I'm going to pray that God would have his way on today. Because I don't want to just preach for information. I want to see transformation in your life. And in my life, because we're better as a result. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it reads, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. To be tempted of the devil. Mark lets us know that it's for 40 days. He's in the wilderness being tempted of the devil. I like the way Matthew sets it up because Matthew says, then was Jesus led up. We have to find out what preceded the then. As we look at the text, we understand that Matthew 3 informs us that Jesus has just made his appearance. That he shows up at the Jordan for baptism. I want to submit this to you that Jesus is baptized not because he is sinful, because it is he who knew no sin, but he's baptized because he submitted. Let me talk to this side to make sure y'all get it. I said Jesus is not baptized. Baptism was a sign that the old man was dying, that there was a judgment on the old man, and that you were moving through. But since Jesus does not have an old man, He's not getting baptized for the same reason everyone else is. This is why John has an issue with Jesus being baptized because Jesus is not being baptized because he's sinful. He's baptized because he submitted. And I want you to hear this. Jesus' status didn't prevent him from submission. But he desired to fulfill the scriptures. Let me say that again. I said Jesus' status. The son of God did not prevent him from submission. 
Jesus' status, the son of God, did not prevent him from submission. Now, there's not too many titles and statuses that supersede son of God. But sometimes we struggle because our statuses prevent us from being submitted to the mission. But Jesus says, I have the highest status possible, yet I find time for submission even though I'm not sinful. And I want to submit to you that if you're going to live this life, that you have to get under a mission that we call submission. And it's impossible for you to fulfill the mission and call of God on your life without submission. Yeah, it's impossible because submission is a choice. You can't even be a true disciple and follower of Jesus Christ without submission. It was at this baptism that Jesus is affirmed, approved, and anointed. Right, But then this leads to something very significant. After he is approved, affirmed, and anointed, he is sent to the wilderness to be attacked. I love what the Message Bible says. The Message Bible says that he was pushed. The King James Version says he was led. Isn't it like God, there are times where he leads us, but we feel like he pushed us into something that we would not have voluntarily entered because the wilderness is a dry place. The wilderness is a place of resistance. I want to submit this to you as we unpack the life of Jesus, that Jesus was not just the greatest leader. I want to submit to you that Jesus was also the greatest follower. Because the Bible does not say that Jesus walks into the wilderness, but that Jesus was led into the wilderness. So Jesus shows us the model for our lives that if we're going to be great leaders, we must also be great followers. Before Jesus leads, he is led. Oh yeah, before Jesus leads... He is led. Before he calls any of the 12, he's proving to us that he can be led. And watch this. He doesn't cease to be led even when he leads. So before you follow, you need to ask who's leading you and who's leading them. Because Paul says this. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. See, I believe it would be easier to lead your spouse if your spouse knew who you were following. Oh, let me try this again. I said it would be easier for you to lead your children if your children could clearly see who you were following. See, it would be easy to lead these church leaders if they could see clearly that you were following Jesus Christ. Paul says it's not good enough for you to follow me if I'm not following him because both of us are going to be lost because how can the blind lead the blind? Before you celebrate who you're leading, you need to establish who you're following. They didn't like that over there, so let me talk to you all. See, some of us are mad that people aren't following us, but we haven't followed anyone. Jesus, before he calls anyone, he leads himself. The greatest person you'll ever lead will be you. And so we see Jesus intentionally being led of the Spirit. Spirit leads in stages, spirit leads in steps, but he's intentionally being led by the spirit. Question of the day is, who are you being led by? Yeah, who are you being led by? Yeah, he's led by the spirit into the wilderness because no one in their right mind would walk into the wilderness. It would take a spiritual move for you to find yourself In the wilderness, it's a place that leaves you totally dependent upon God. Yeah, the wilderness is necessary for your growth, for your development, for your moving forward. And the Bible says that he's not just led there for any reason, but he's led there 
to be tempted, enticed by the devil. So he leads them to the witness to be tested of the devil. Let me say this. A good father tests his son because he believes in him. But a son never tests his father. I said a good father tests his son because he believes in him. I test Paige every day. I stand on one side of the room and talk to see if she can turn her head and recognize my voice. Because good parents test their offspring. But let Paige rise up and try to test me. We're going to have some problems. Because testing is a part of the development. It was at the Pacific Union Railroad that they were constructing a bridge. And wanting to test the bridge, the builder loaded a train with some extra carts. And one of the workers said, are you trying to break this bridge? He said, no, I'm trying to prove that this bridge won't break. And isn't that the way with God? God doesn't test us to fell us. God tests us to promote us. Because he's trying to prove you are who you say you are. And how would you know you are Genuine, unless except you be tested. So I start thinking about this thing because we've been talking about strength and resistance. Strength and resistance. And, and I realize um, that I consistently, some weeks more consistently than others, go to the gym. Yeah, I go to the gym. I don't spend all of my time in church, contrary to popular opinions. To find myself in the gym. And, and there's a very popular um, gym in this area called Gold's Gym. But I realized that Gold was not the only one that had a gym. That God has a gym. And this is what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about God's gym. Yeah, I want to talk about God's gym. Because usually the wilderness looks very similar to a gymnasium. And some of you were not led by the spirit, but you were led by doctor's orders even this season to find yourself in a gymnasium. And, and watch this. I realized that in order to maximize your potential in a gymnasium, that you need a trainer. Because a trainer is simply a tour guide in the gymnasium. Someone that's already familiar with the tools you're going to be using. And I don't know about you, but when I look at the scriptures, it says that the Holy Spirit will lead and guide us into all truth. So now we have a personal trainer we call the Holy Spirit who leads us to a gymnasium that Jesus called the wilderness. It was after Israel was led through the Red Sea that they find themselves in a gymnasium. Because God is trying to build and impart something on the inside of them. Uh, he leads you to a place of resistance. This is why we don't want to go to a gymnasium because it's a place of resistance. It's a place of hardship. It's a place of trial. But God realizes there's something in you that you can't see in yourself. And the only way I can bring it to the surface is to put you in a gymnasium. Yeah, because all of these machines, the reason we hate these machines, oh God help us with these machines, is because these machines represent resistance. The weights represent resistance. And if there was no resistance, the load would be easy. But he sends us to a place where there's resistance. Yes. Sends us to a place in the desert where there is no water. And we got to believe God that he'll give us water through a rock. He sends us to a place of resistance. And many of us want to stay away from a place of resistance. And watch this, we don't mind being in the gym, we just don't want to deal with the resistance. 
There's always people in the gym that are just standing around talking, but they're not actually exercising. And you wonder why they leave the same way they came because they have not handled properly the resistance. So these machines symbolize the resistance. Um, these machines many times looks like the enemy. This is why some of you, you're dealing with anxiety since we put these machines on the altar. Because these are the things you've been trying to run from, but you can run, but you can hide. They're still here. And there's always something to remind you. So the truth of the matter is we see that this gym is here. And we got to deal with different types of resistance when we show up to God's gym. Uh, first of all, we got to deal with the enemy in our mind. Because watch this, the enemy in your mind wants you to focus on the pain instead of embracing the progress. Oh, yeah. This is why we hate resistance, because resistance brings pain. Y'all don't go work out. Let me talk to the gym rats over here. I said resistance brings pain. They don't work out either. Let me talk to the balcony. I said resistance brings pain. This is why you got to motivate yourself to get up out the bed and go to the gymnasium because resistance brings pain. And sometimes it's easier for me to focus on the pain instead of embracing the progress. This is why some of us cannot work out without a headset on. And music, because music serves as a distraction from the pain. Can I submit this to you that if you're going through a pain, that's why you can't miss an opportunity to praise God. Because praise is a distraction from the pain that you're dealing with. If you lift him up, your problem won't seem as big. Your struggle won't seem as hard because you've learned how to praise. I'm talking about the people that really work out. The truth of the matter is we all need some distractions. Because sometimes the pain... It's unbearable. Sometimes your knees start squeaking. The pains is unbearable. But the pain is what's going to bring the progress. The thing you don't want to do is the thing that's going to cause you to do what you desire to do. And then we, we have mental gymnastics. We ask the question, are you trying to keep me or kill me? Yeah, yeah, I need to know you're trying to keep me or kill me. Isn't it amazing that when the Peter and, and the disciples are going to the other side, when they're on the boat with Jesus, that a storm breaks out, and they said, Master, do you care if we die? I don't know if you're trying to kill me or keep me. If you've ever worked out, you don't know if you're dying or you living because it's the pain and the resistance from the workout that has you like that. And some of you are in the middle of a spiritual workout, and you're wondering God's intentions for your life. And I came here to remind you that God has a plan for you for good and not for evil to give you a hope in an expected end. If you would just trust him and endure the process, you're going to make some progress. Why don't you prophesy to somebody say this year, I'm going to make great progress. Yeah, many times we don't want to deal with the resistance that comes from the gym we have mental gymnastics we go back and forth in our mind whenever I would do good evil is present that's why I gotta keep my mind stayed on him so he'll keep me in perfect peace because all of us have gone through some mental gymnastics we didn't know if God was our friend or our enemy when we're in the gym you, you don't know if your trainer is your friend or your enemy I see people randomly walk through the gym and they prescribe their own workout regimen but then I see other people being led by a trainer in other words they're not just in there by happenstance they're there intentionally and their trainer will go ahead and select the machines they will be on they already have a workout plan for them and watch this that's the difference between a believer and an unbeliever we have a trainer And the trainer knows how much you can bear. And they'll never put more on you than you can bear. Let, let, let me talk a little bit more. We, we talked about this medicine ball right here. We talked about, about, about this medicine ball. This is a medicine ball. Yeah, this is a medicine ball. It has weight on it. This medicine ball is not easy to carry. 
And this medicine ball, the objective is to pass it to someone else. It teaches us how to cast our burdens and cast our cares. But let me put this out for you. Sometimes we don't know if this is a medicine ball or a wrecking ball. Yeah. Isn't that how life is when God throws something at you? You don't know if he's trying to bring you healing or if he's trying to give you a relapse. You don't know if it's a medicine ball or a wrecking ball. We don't know if the weight is making us better or the weight is making us bitter. And this isn't just like life when we're in God's workout. We don't know if there's temptations to bring us to our demise or there's temptations to bring us to our deliverance. And many of us are dealing with the medicine ball because God's seeing that the weight is making you better. You think it's making you worse, but God says, I see it making you better. And you got to trust me that even when I put it on you, that I'm going to help you lift it. Yeah, yeah. He tempted me to turn these stones into bread because he doesn't want me to reach my destination or will this be used to propel me into my destination. Understand this is that the spirit led him up into the wilderness. That means when you follow in the spirit, there's always elevation, but elevation does not come without resistance. Some of us are mad at God because we mistook a medicine ball for a wrecking ball. And why did God throw this at me? Why did God give me this responsibility? Why did God take my young teenage and young adult years? Why did he do that? And you look at a, it's a wrecking ball. God says, I see the end results. And that's not a wrecking ball. That's a medicine ball. Because you don't realize every time you throw it back at me, you are developing muscles that you didn't have before. I see your biceps. I see your triceps. You just see the frustration. God sees something on you that you can't see. Yourself. You, you're tired of carrying the burden, but God says, I'm developing a prayer life in you. You can't see it. You used to skip prayer, but now you don't skip any leg days or prayer days. Because the truth of the matter is, you know you need me every moment, every second of the day. And even though you think you're getting worse, God says, I see you getting better. Look at somebody say, you're getting better, you're getting better, you're getting better. God says, you see the ball, I see what the ball is producing. Paul says, Lord, deliver me from this thorn. He prayed three times. God says, no. He, he says, it's producing something in you. It's not wrecking you, it's building you. It's not wrecking you, it's reviving you. And you got to know the difference between a wrecking ball and a medicine ball when you're in God's gym. Because God will send you through some things that it would appear he's trying to wreck your life. It, they don't serve the God I serve. Let, let me tell you, y'all. God will send you through some things where it seems like he's trying to wreck your life. Job went through God's gym and it seemed like God was trying to wreck his life. But in reality, he was setting him up for double for his trouble. But it seemed like God was trying to wreck him. God was trying to make him better. And so that's why it's always a temptation to grow bitter. Because we mistake a medicine ball for a wrecking ball. And we treat God as if he threw a wrecking ball to us instead of a medicine ball. Even if the enemy threw it, God authorized it. And this is the reality. You caught more than you thought you could catch. You've bared more than you thought you could bear. You've handled more than you thought you could handle. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I came here to tell you what do it make you bitter this season? You got to make sure it makes you better. I see you're stronger. I see you're wiser. I see a greater anointing on you because of the way you handle the medicine ball. Sometimes the thing you think is designed to bring hurt to your life is really designed to bring healing. But if you don't know you're in God's gymnasium, you'll curse God when it's really an opportunity to bless him. 
When he tells you, give me one more lap, and it seems like you're wheezing, and you don't have any more to give, and God says, I see a little bit more in you than you can see yourself. Can you go that extra mile? God says, because I'm going to show you something about yourself, because it's in the gymnasium where you learn who God is, and you learn who you are. How would I know he was a healer if I was never sick? How would I know that he was a way maker if I never felt like I was trapped? How would I know that he was a friend if I was never friendly? So he sends you to a gymnasium. And it seems like God's playing games, but we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and that are called according to his purpose. Some of y'all keep saying, I keep catching hell. Yeah, I keep, I keep catching, not heaven, hell. Preacher is preaching heaven. I'm catching hell. And he's saying, I'm using the hell to develop you. Because Jesus survived hell, and so can you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Some of y'all getting tense about the word hell. You use it in a different context, so don't play me today. I felt some of your spirit. Did he cuss? No, I didn't cuss. That's what you do, okay? So let's... So now that we're acquainted, <laughs> you, you got to know how to handle what life throws your way. Because sometimes a wrecking ball is a medicine ball. But it'll never put more on you than you and him can bear. It's in the gym where you're tempted to take shortcuts. Some of y'all never worked out really hard. When you work out really hard, you said you was going to be on the machine for 20 minutes. You start looking for a way of escape at 10. You know you're in God's gymnasium. Jesus was on a 40-day fast. He was hungry. And the Satan tried to offer him a shortcut. Say, cause this stone to turn into bread. Listen, you don't have to go to the cross. I can give it to you before you go to the cross. He tries to give you a shortcut because when you're in God's gymnasium, he'll always offer you a shortcut. But when you half step, it'll take twice as long. Isn't that the temptation? Every time I get on a machine, I'm tempted to get off. Tempted to take the shortcut. It's the longest 10 minutes of my life. Some of y'all laughing at my 10 minutes. You have zero minutes. But it's the longest 10 minutes of my life. And the temptation is to take a shortcut. Some of you have to make some hard decisions, and the enemy has given you an option of a shortcut. A shortcut. Because every door you're not supposed to walk in because some doors are trap doors. And it'll cost you longer in the long run. It'll cost you more in the long run. And so the enemy tries to tempt you with shortcuts. Look at somebody say, no more shortcuts. Yeah. Endure hardness as a good soldier. And so the truth of the matter is, hold up. Let, let me have my water. Y'all bring my water out here? Y'all didn't bring my water? How am I ever going to work out without water? <laughs> Thank you, Brother T-Bear. Appreciate you. Watch this. I don't drink water like I'm supposed to. But I've never been to a gymnasium and saw somebody with a two-liter Coke while they were working out. <laughs> Like, you have to be crazy to be in a gymnasium. You an addict. If you're in the gymnasium, the two-liter Mountain Dew, you're an addict. And God's going to deliver you today. You're, you're an addict. People that normally don't even drink water at home 
when you're in a gymnasium, you begin to thirst for water. This is why God allows some hardship to hit your life. Because you did not want to read the word until hardship hit you. And the hardship changed your appetite till you started to thirst after water instead of after all those carnal things. Because you're like, this self-help book won't help. This advice won't help. I need the word of God because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out the mouth of God. And now I thirst after water. He said, drink from this well and you'll never thirst again. Can I get a witness? So, so it changes your thirst because it's in God's gym where you start looking for answers. It's in God's gym where you start looking for solutions. It's in God's gym where you start looking for his hand. And you would not have done that unless you were under extreme circumstances. That's why some of you are at church right now. Because you find yourself in the gymnasium. And you're losing more. You're sweating and you got to replenish yourself. And you say, God, I need you this year. Because it's already January and it feels like it's November. Me and my wife were talking. This is the longest first month that I've ever experienced. I came to church thinking it was Black History Month. And my wife was like, it's still January. I was like, for real? This is a long January. And I, haven't said it, I didn't say it wasn't good. It's just long. And you got to get water because water helps you to endure. Because if you don't drink the water, you'll faint from dehydration. And David said this, I would have fainted if I didn't believe to see the goodness of the Lord while in the land of the living. I know it seems bad. I know it seems hard. But if you get some water, you can survive. Right? We live in an information age. And yet, we're no longer wise. Because we have so many options that we don't choose water any longer. I know what that's like. You had to move almost all my options before I choose water. Y'all had Gatorade? Yeah. And maybe that's how our lives are. God has to move all the options until we reach for the water. But it's in the gymnasium where you reach for the water. Can I read this passage of scripture and then get out your way? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. I want to read it from the voice translation. He says, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of grace who has called you to his everlasting presence through Jesus the anointed will restore you, support you, strengthen you, and ground you. So watch this. I'm not in God's gym in vain. God has a plan for his gym. And one of the plans is he wants to provide support. He says, I want to support you in the gym. I'm your trainer. I'm going to provide support and motivation. When you feel like you're not going to be able to make it through, I'm going to tell you to keep on running because I provide support. And then while you do these exercises, you're going to find out that you're getting stronger. Let me ask you a question. When you look at some of the tests you're facing in 2024, if the enemy would have caught you last year, you probably would have failed the test. But because you've endured hardness, because you stayed in the gym, you're handling the test a little differently because God is giving you strength. Some of you tired of waiting, but the Bible says, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew strength. So even waiting builds a muscle. Then it stabilizes you. Right? It stabilizes you. People that are struggling physically with limbs and elements and, and even stability, many times part of their therapy is to start exercising because it brings stability to you. So you won't just fall over. So that you can stand the test of time. It stabilizes you. I know we don't like it. But watch this. He gets us to trade happiness for joy. 
he gets us to upgrade to peace in God's gym. Because when you're in God's gym, you got to have a peace that surpasses all understanding. Because why should I rejoice when I'm feeling all this pain? Because I know this pain is going to bring my promotion. I know this pain is going to bring me progress. So I'm learning to rejoice in my infirmities. I'm learning to count it all joy when I fall into diverse temptations, diverse testing. Because I know that it's working something on the inside of me. And many times God sends you to gyms like that so you can upgrade and he can bring stability. Then he wants to settle you. He wants to settle you. Some of us are all over the place. God says, I want to settle you. I want to settle you. I want you to know me. I don't want you just to have religion. I want you to have relationship. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want you just to memorize the scripture. I want you to have a revelation of the Savior. I want to settle you. I want to settle you. I want you to be like the Apostle Paul. Yes, I thank God for the river experience. But I've learned how to endure the desert experience. And I'm like the Apostle Paul. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. I'm settled. As long as God is with me, I'm going to be okay because I'm settled. I may not have everything I want, but praise be to God, I've got everything I need because I'm settled. May not have the job I want, may not have the house I want, but because I got the presence of God, I am settled. I'm single and settled. I'm married and settled. Whatever state I'm in, I find myself settled because God has worked something out in my life. If that's your testimony, I want you to give God some glory. Come on, somebody prophetically is saying, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. I've been through a lot. I've been through danger, seen and unseen. I've seen arrows by day. I've seen, I've seen all of this stuff. I, I've been in the valleys and I've been on the mountains. And I've learned to be content because God has settled me. Yes, some of us got on poker faces today. If you knew what we were going through, you would be scared for us. But because God has settled us. And I like what the message Bible says. It says that God has the last say. Ooh, can I preach to somebody? That's the reason you're settled. Because the doctor said one thing, but you know God has the final say you know circumstances said one thing but you know God has the final say your age is saying one thing your biological clock is saying one thing but you know that God has the final say and this is why I have peace in the middle of the storm because God has the final say if you going through something right now and God hasn't spoken yet you got a reason to give him glory because it's not over until God says it's over give him some praise Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Some of y'all out of shape. You can't even praise God on this morning. I need somebody to give God some praise. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. One thing a workout does is causes you to lose breath. But I dare you to prophesy to yourself and say, my second wind is coming. I've got to give God praise. I've got to give God glory. I've got to celebrate God. The enemy tried to take me out, but I still got breath. The enemy tried to depress me, but I still got breath. I can't preach like this. The song doesn't say as long as my bills are paid, I'll give you praise. As long as there's breath in my body. And the good thing about it, you don't even have to have fresh breath to give God praise. You just got to have breath. The 
Because sometimes life can be so bad, things are not even fresh any longer. But God says, as long as you got breath, look at somebody say, I still got breath. I've been through a whole lot. I know you hear me panting, but I'm panting after God. I still got breath. I know the enemy thought it's gonna huff and puff and blow my house down, but I still got breath. Got some hurt feelings, but still got breath. Got some concerns, but I still got breath. And I'm gonna give God some praise because I still have breath. I'm running and almost tired, but I still got breath. Please be seated, please be seated. Please be seated, I gotta move. Please be seated. Please, be. you thought you needed a better reason to give God praise. The only reason you need to give God praise is breath. Because the enemy would have had his way, he would have took your breath. Please be seated, we gotta move. There's some scholarly people here today. I've been working out before, and it seemed like I lost all my breath. People were calling me on the phone. I was sending them a voicemail because I didn't have breath to talk to people. That's what some of y'all, y'all sending certain people to voicemail that's calling to help you because you out of breath, because of what you're dealing with. Some of y'all just say, I'm tired, Lord. You ever just had a woman with the Lord say, I'm just tired. I'm just tired. Over and over and over and over again, and I'm tired. You know, one of the exercise tools I get on is this elliptical machine, this, this staircase machine uh, that you just walk up the stairs and walk up the stairs, and it seems like you're going nowhere. You just walk up the stairs and walk up the stairs, and I'm like, God, I'm tired of going through the motion and not getting anywhere. He said, you think the objective is to take you somewhere. The objective is to build something in you. This is why they had to walk around in circles for 40 years. Not because God was so interested in taking them somewhere. It's because God had to build something in them before he could take them somewhere. Some of y'all are in the gym right now. It's okay. You can look at me like you don't like me. That's how people look when they're in the gym. Nobody's smiling in the gym. Not when you're really working out. I've been there. And when people take the picture of themselves, it's after they wipe their face, they put on some fresh makeup. But when you're really in the gym, there's nothing exciting and fun about being in the gym. But God uses it to transform us. Can I read more, one more passage of scripture? I want to read this passage of scripture. This is from Mark 1.13. And I hope it ministers to you like it ministers to me. Mark 1.13. It says, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days. And was with the wild animals, and the angels ministered unto him. Watch this. This is after Satan leaves and looks for a more opportune time. The Bible says um, that Jesus receives ministry, that the angels minister to him, and he's also with the wild beasts. Now, somebody said this. A wilderness is not a wilderness if there's not wild beasts. Which says to us... That in the wilderness, there's something that's designed to eat us. But God is so awesome. When he's called you to the gym, what's designed to eat you will minister to you. The coyote that was designed to eat you will minister to you. The wolf that was designed to eat you will minister to you. And God says, I'm about to reverse what was meant to devour you. And I'm going to use it to develop you because I'm faithful. And they minister to Jesus. As we get ready to close, I want to give you an opportunity as you stand to your feet. Just to receive the ministry of Jesus. I came here to prophesy to you that you were in God's gym. And God says, after you suffer for a while, he's going to restore you. After you suffer for a while, he's going to establish you. After you suffer for a while, he's going to settle you. And then you're going to receive ministry. This is your moment for revival. I want you to stretch your hands towards heaven. And begin to worship God. And receive the ministry. Get a cancer was designed to eat you. But when you're in the wilderness with God, God has you covered. 
it's going to serve you. Yes, the job loss was designed to kill you, but it's going to serve you. Yes, the abandonment was designed to kill you, but it's going to serve you. What the enemy meant for evil, God's going to make it work for your good. Because it's going to serve you. God changed the nature. God changed the nature of the wild beast. You don't believe God can change the nature of animals? A scavenger, a raven's meant to take. But God commanded a raven to come feed the man of God. And I'm not saying the ravens are going to win the Super Bowl. But I wouldn't be surprised if they do to communicate to us a prophetic message that God is going to bless us from uncommon sources. God is going to send our provision from uncommon sources. I feel a prophetic move happening here. How do you go for 40 days without the wild beast finding you? Jesus' biggest concern was not food. There was wild beasts there that left him alone because he was there on assignment. And there's some things that can't touch you because you're there on assignment. Couldn't touch Job's health. Couldn't touch Job's wife because Job was in that process on assignment. You know, when you have a trainer at my gym, there's certain rooms you can go into that other people can't go into without a trainer. When Jesus is your trainer, that's a place you can go that others can't follow. Because the safest place in the whole wide world is the will of God. There's some people here today. You say, Pastor, you know what? I recognize that I canceled my membership to the gym. I realized that I got so overwhelmed that I gave up. But I realized that God still has a plan and a purpose for my life. And I know I'm not going to make it through life because sometimes life is hard without Jesus Christ. I'm not going to be able to survive without his presence. And so on today, with my out of shape self, I just want to surrender. Because I believe he can make something out of my life if I surrender it to him. The same Jesus that can take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed a multitude can do something with my life if I just surrender to him. If that's you today, I'm not going to ask you for anything other than to raise your hand. I want to pray for you wherever you are, all over the sanctuary, would you raise your hand? Even in the balcony, online, raise your hand, raise your cyber hand. I see those hands. I see those hands. Come on, wave back at me. Wave back at me. Let me know. God bless you. I see all of you all. I see all of you all. I see all of you. I see all of you all. I see all of you. God's doing the work in your life. God's doing your work in your life. And if you hear that, say, Pastor, I need to be connected to a community of believers where I can grow, where I can flourish. This church is not perfect, but we're always going to have a gym-like atmosphere where we can grow through and not just go through. I want to encourage you to raise your hand wherever you are. I want to pray for you wherever you are. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And I want you to take another step of faith, if you will. I want you to meet me right here in the front. I just want to pray for you very quickly. If you just would do that, just very quickly. You have nothing to be ashamed about. All of us have gone through a gym, and all of us need Christ to help us through. Thank you for responding. Thank you for responding. I don't want to prolong this. I just want to connect with you. I don't want to prolong this. I just want to connect with you. I don't want to prolong this. I don't want to prolong this. God is speaking to hearts. I know what some of you are saying, Pastor, there's too many people. I don't feel like telling them, excuse me. Well, stay where you are. That's fine. I got your back. You know, you can get saved right there. But if you know you need to make a public declaration, I want to meet you right here. If you're in the balcony, we'll wait on you if you want to walk. 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 If you're in the audience and pastor, I'm not ready to move. I just want you to know that I, I need Jesus. I want you to wave your hand again so I can pray for you wherever you are. God bless you. Thank you for your hand. God bless you. God bless you. See that hand? God bless you. 
God bless you. Even in the balcony, it's hard to see your hands, so wave back at me. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Yeah, it's not me that saves. It's Jesus that saves. He sees your hand. Hopefully your hand is a revelation of what's in your heart. And so as we prepare to close, let's just take about 20 seconds just to worship God right where you are. still speak in your heart, you can move during this time. We just wanted to take a few moments to pause. that our after picture, but you didn't see our before picture. There's so much more to the story. You're not done with me. Say you're not done. You're not done with me. If you believe it, lift your hands. You're not done with me. There's so much more to the story. There's so much more to the story. You're not done with me. Listen, this is the most important decision you'll ever make in your entire life. Sometimes we give up on God before he gives up on us. And I want to encourage you not to do that. Because his grace is sufficient. And he says, I never leave you nor forsake you. The enemy can't make you lose, but he'll try to make you quit. And it's too early to quit. I don't care how late it seems, it's too early to quit. Things may not change in one workout, but if you stay consistent, sooner or later, things will work out in your favor. And it's not about just working out, it's about who you work out with. So enjoy the relationship. I want you to repeat after me, say, Father God, I realize that I'm a sinner, that I've fallen short of your standard for my life. But I'm so glad you sent your son Jesus to die for my sins, to forgive me, and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And right now, Father, I receive your grace. I receive your son. And from this day forward, my life would never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand praise. I prophesy you're getting stronger. You're getting better. And faithful to see that called you, that will also do it.